All right, everybody, today we're going to start working on this 73 Corvette. So this Corvette is a customer's car, and it's kind of the same story that a lot of people have. He's had it for a long time, and he's finally tired of seeing it sit, and he wants me to go through it for him and get it to that daily driver status. We're going to start focusing on the engine. That's the first thing we're going to do. As with most cars, I'm waiting for parts. Uh, but the plans for this engine are uh, a new intake, a different carburetor, we're going to do a full tune-up, so cap, rotor, wires, plugs. Uh, it's leaking a bunch of oil out of the valve covers, so those are going to need to be taken care of. The car does run and drive, it just doesn't do it very well. It takes forever to start because the choke isn't working. It idles really, really high, and well, it just needs little things. Once we get the mechanicals done, we'll move on to the interior, but the nifty part about this car is that it is actually a four-speed car. So, that's always cool. And, of course, 73s are always awesome anyway, so... Like I said, we're going to start with the, uh, the engine and go from there. Now, here's the thing. I am waiting for parts, so there's not much I can do other than uh, spark plugs and uh, valve cover gaskets today, but... That's okay, we can do that, and you know, get something done on the car so it's not just sitting. We're first going to do the spark plugs, so these are all the tools that I use to do spark plugs. So, the plugs themselves, I have tape and a marker to mark the plug wires. Um, you can either do them one at a time or mark the, all the plug wires, whichever one you want to do. There's a gapper uh, for the plug gap. I have anti-seize uh, for the threads and the plug. This says battery and terminal and cable protector, but it's dielectric grease. It's the same stuff that you would use on the ends of these. So just so the boots come off a little easier next time. And then your tools, so you need a wrench, you need a 5 8 plug socket, a set of extensions, and sometimes a swivel. On a C3, it's not too bad um, to do the plugs. It's not like having a C4 where you need a whole bunch of different stuff. You should be okay with just these two, but I included them just because you never know. Well, we got the first plug out, and as expected, the outside's oily. Well, it's an old engine, and the valve covers are leaking all over, but, I mean, it's just... It smells a lot like gas. I know that carburetor doesn't run very well, so hopefully the new one will kind of fix that. But, again, yeah, these are old. They need, they need replaced, so those can go in the trash. When it comes to the new plug, you want to put the anti-seize on the threads. You want to put... Uh, the dielectric grease on the end once you get the plug in. I usually like to put a little bit in the end of the spark plug wire boot. And then you also want to gap it. They come pretty much pre-gapped, but uh, 35 thousandths is where you want to do it. Uh, you slide this in between the electrode on the plug, and then you set your gap. Pretty easy. I'm going to replace all eight spark plugs, but I will not uh, do the put the spark plug wires back on yet because again the intake needs to come off and all that kind of stuff. With the spark plugs all in we can start taking things apart in order to replace the uh, valve cover gaskets but also redo the intake. Uh, I plan on removing the carburetor, the thermostat housing, the distributor, all that kind of stuff. A good tip is to take your smartphone and take pictures from every angle of the engine just so you you don't have to worry about remembering where everything went and how it went together. You'll have pictures of it. With the carb gone and with the valve covers off, we can kind of see a little bit better what the problem was with the valve covers. So, uh, two problems. One, they were over torqued. So you can see how that kind of pooches up like that. We're going to have to fix that if we want to go back with these same valve covers. But the second problem is, you see all the residue from the cork gasket? It's only on the bottom side. So the bottom half of that gasket gets super hot because it's next to the manifolds, and the top doesn't. So what happens is the gasket gets all dried out and crappy, and then it starts leaking. Of course, on the, the part that matters, the low part where the oil comes out, we're going to replace uh, these gaskets with the rubber type, and I'm pretty sure they will last a little bit longer. But both sides are basically pretty much the same. Next, we're going to go and take the intake off. Before you mess around with anything up here, you have to drain the coolant because water goes through the head into the intake and then into the other head on this side and also this side. You need to make sure you get the water drained before you do it because what's going to happen is if you lift that intake off 
without draining the water, all the water will go down into your motor, into your oil pan, and then you have water in your oil, which is not good. Another thing you need to do is, before you pull this distributor, you need to pop the distributor cap off, and then mark, or at least I like to take pictures and mark, the position of the distributor itself and where the rotor is pointing. And then when you put it back all together, you put it in the same spot and you should be fine. Here's the uh, intake that's going to get put on it. There's not a piece of... That's just a butte right there. It's a beautiful thing. It will make the engine look better and hopefully perform at least a little better. It's a smog engine, so it's not like it's a big horsepower engine anyway, but it'll look nice. We are just a couple of steps away from pulling this intake. We have to take that off. And then from there, we have to pull the distributor. So, like I said in the previous section, I've marked where the the rotor is. When you pull the distributor up, the rotor is going to rotate backwards, and when you put it in, it also rotates. Now, if I loosen the distributor up, I could rotate the base without this rotor moving. That's how you change your timing. We don't want to put it in a different spot than it was. So we will take a picture basically like this to make sure when we have the, it dropped into our new intake, we will put it in the exact same spot. Before you lift the intake off, I would recommend that you take a flat blade screwdriver and you kind of scrape up all this junk that's on the intake and vacuum it up with your vacuum. The reason why is because when you lift it off, you don't want any of this stuff falling in your motor. Probably should have done it before the valve covers were off, but it's not too hard to you know, scrape it and use the vacuum to suck it up as you go. I will be doing that, and then from there, all the intake bolts have to come off, and we're ready to pull it. All the bolts on this intake are 9 16 which you can get out with a regular tool, but uh, the bolts on the inside, this one, this one, and then these two on the back, you're going to need something like this, a swivel, and a short socket. Without this, you're never going to get them off. You can try to use a closed end, you know, box end wrench on them, and I've seen that done before, but you need a swivel. You need this little, little elbow thing in order to get them off. Did you guys see that? There's no thermostat in this car whatsoever. Why? Why do people do that? That makes me think there might be an overheating problem that we don't know about yet. So frustrating. Well, that is what we want to see. It's a nice, clean lifter valley. There's no, I mean, not much sludge at all. There's no chunks, there's no metal pieces, nothing like that. At least the person who put this on, I believe they did it correctly. They used RTV on the china walls instead of those stupid gaskets that come in your kit. So, eventually this car will get a different motor. This is just to get it reliable and safe for now. But... The next step is going to be putting a bunch of towels in the lifter valley and then we need to clean all the gasket surfaces and make them all pretty again so we can put the new intake in. The last thing I like to do after I've cleaned all the surfaces with a razor blade is use grease and wax remover to clean up the surfaces just a little bit more. You could probably use brake clean. I don't know. This is just what I've always used. Brake clean is probably cheaper than that. But, you know, just put it on a towel like this and wipe it around and you'll be amazed at the amount of dirt that you can get off of it. But the cleaner, uh, the cleaner and the flatter the surfaces you can get, the better it's going to fit. When you go to put the intake uh, gaskets on, what I like to do is put silicone around all the openings, really thin, and uh, on both sides. And before you get ready to put the intake on, instead of using the little rubber gaskets that give you through the end, you put a quarter inch bead of silicone all the way across here and then all the way across here. I also like to let the gaskets sit on the heads for a little bit before I put the intake on because there's less like there's less of a chance for them to slip when I put the intake on. The first step on getting these valve covers ready to go back on besides cleaning the nasty outsides is we need to clean the gasket surface and I'm using a plastic scraper to get most of this RTV off um, if this doesn't work and you're still having issues, um, the best thing to do after this would be a, a soft wire wheel on a drill, but mine's working pretty well. After that, you take a hammer and you make sure these holes are flat. I'll show you how to do that. And then you clean it, clean it, and then you glue your gasket on and let it sit overnight so that way it doesn't slip when you put it on the car. 
For the most part, the valve cover is cleaned up. I want to show you guys, if you can see this edge right here, how it pooches up. Maybe this edge. Anyway, it goes up a little bit because somebody's over tightened the valve covers. These, this one is not as bad as the other one was, but still you can kind of see the little rise right here. When you hammer it back down with a hammer, it, it evens it out, but one thing you also want to check is you want to check if it's smooth all the way around all the edges. Make sure that it is, because if it's warped in any way, um, it's not going to seal. And if it is warped, you can always take a crescent wrench like this and then you know, lightly and carefully bend the edges the way you need them to go. Chopstick. Go. Get the get the fly. Get the buck. Get it. Go. Get it. Go get it. Go. There's a fly. Go get it. Get the fly. No? Okay. Putting on the RTV is pretty easy. Basically you just take it like this. Just go quickly down it. And what I like to do is take my finger and rub my finger down it so that it's nice and smooth. Once you're done with that, you can put on your gasket. So the RTV is really good at getting the uh, gasket to stick where it needs to be because if you don't have it then it's going to want to go toward the center. You want to stick it back all the way on the edges like that. There you go. Now you have it there that you can let it dry overnight and install it tomorrow and not have to worry about it slipping. Once your gaskets are dry, put on another really thin coat of RTV. This is really just to help it stick. I don't think it seals much. I think the gasket does most of the sealing. And here is the finished product. So yeah, the valve covers kind of look crappy against the brand new intake. But it looks better than it used to. I wanted to paint them black, but the owner of this car is going to swap this motor out for a big block eventually, so we will make that one pretty when the time comes. And then for this one, well, we're just going to make it reliable so we can drive it for a year or so, so we can save up money to do the swap. With the distributor dropped in, we can go ahead and put on the cap, the rotor, the spark plug wires, and also the water neck. I'm still waiting on the carburetor uh, that we bought online to come. But here are all the goodies that were delivered to my house. So first in this box we're going to have a new rotor. The one on the car isn't too bad, but you know what? If you're going to replace the cap, you should replace the rotor as well. They're really not expensive. It's like maybe, maybe $30 for the pair. And if you're going to have new plugs, new wires, you might as well have new everything. So there's those two parts. This is what I was curious about. So I got this from Advanced Auto, and it's a brand new water neck. And you know what? It was only like $6. So to me, that's worth buying and putting on just because, I mean, that's going to look so much better than what, what is on it now. There. Really? Yeah, it's an easy decision. You know, for six bucks, it's whatever. And it actually comes with a gasket, so if it's really only four dollars, because that's about a two dollar gasket. And then, of course, to make this complete, we have a thermostat ready to go. So, something that the customer told me was wrong with his car is that the temperature didn't register on the gauge. And I'm thinking, maybe, if I'm lucky, the reason why is because the engine actually never got to temperature because it had no thermostat in it so it was running 
you know, 100 and, you know, 20 or whatever the whole time because water is continuously flowing. The reason people put thermostats in it is to put the minimum temperature. That's what they do. So the engine's going to get hot up to this point and then it'll open and the coolant will start flowing and go from there. So we're going to put all this on and then once we're done with that we can wait for the carburetor and that's going to be fun. I also need to find some of these, I need to fill some of these holes in the intake, these extra holes as well. The 73 is coming along. I have the distributor installed and a brand new set of plug wires put in. The reason why I had to get new plug wires, I probably could have used these, but there's a couple of them that fell on the uh, manifold and burnt up. So they're trash. But they weren't that expensive, and after I loomed them up with some good old zip ties, they actually look pretty good. Um, next is going to be putting on the carburetor, getting all that sorted out, and then really going from there, it shouldn't be long before we can fire it up and see uh, how much better it's going to run, because I know it will. So our main concern is going to be a fuel leak, since we redid the fuel line. So what I will do is I will unplug the distributor. So there's no spark, and that will do two things. One, I can check for a fuel leak, and two, it'll fill the carburetor full of gas, so whenever we turn the key with the spark engaged, it should fire right up. to run so what I'm doing is I'm checking make sure we don't have any oil leaks we look pretty good make sure we don't have any water leaks look good on that as well make sure we don't have any gas leaks we don't want any of that so I think we need to play around with the timing because it idles really high and that's kind of the issue that we had with the other carburetor having issues with the car idling high as you guys saw it just didn't like it and then I discovered I was thinking well it's either timing or vacuum leaks and I had the timing pretty much where it was I was pretty sure the balancer hadn't slipped but then I traced back the wires this goes to the the charcoal canister uh, for the PCV and then 
Uh, obviously, the vacuum hose to the vacuum advance is going to leak. Brake booster wasn't leaking, but then I saw this. I was like, where does that go? So I traced it all the way down, and down in the depths, you can see it right there. It just ends, so it's straight up vacuum leak in this car. Um, I know it has to do with the emission stuff. I'm not going to mess with it right now for the time being. I'm just going to cap that port and get rid of that line. It'll kind of clean up the engine bay, and hopefully it'll run a little better. Let's give it another go. One more time. Take it for a drive.
you saw in the last video clip, I couldn't get the engine to idle down. It just would idle at like 2,500, 2,000 RPM. It was a lot. And uh, talking to some people I know and, you know, searching online, uh, the only thing I can think of is that these butterflies on the underneath of the carb are not shutting all the way. And here, if you look, you can see there's quite a considerable gap. This guy has a little bit of gas still in it, but I mean, you can see how it doesn't shut all the way. Um, I'm pretty sure that's why somebody ditched this carb in the beginning anyway, probably because they couldn't get it to idle down. But, I mean, you look at that, they're supposed to look a lot like these ones, you know, shut all the way. And the fix to that is going to be loosening up these screws, shutting it all the way, then turning them back in. Uh, it looks like somebody's already played around with these, which kind of, you know, would lead me to believe the reason behind, you know, all this stuff. So, I will do that. Throw it back on the engine, fire it up, and see if that makes any difference. We had a little bit of change of plans. Uh, the Edelbrock carburetor that uh, we got off of eBay just didn't really work out and it wasn't performing the way that uh, either I or Norris wanted to. So uh, we bought a new Holly carburetor and we're gonna put that on today. So brand new out of the box from Summit Racing. I love new carburetors, they're like the coolest thing ever. But we're gonna take this off and we're going to put it on. It should be pretty much a bolt-on carb and should fire right up and be ready to go.
thousand times better than it ever has. It's time to take care of a few little drivability issues um, that Norris has asked me to take care of. Uh, the first is going to be the speedometer. So, right as of now, nothing works at all. And I traced the cable all the way to the transmission and I unplugged it. So what I plan on doing is I plan on using this drill to spin the cable and see if the, the speedometer works. If it does work, then that means it's something inside the transmission and I'll have to talk to him and see if he wants to dig any deeper. Um, at least with automatic transmissions, let me show you. There's a little gear inside of the transmission. In order to get to it, you know that you have to take the cross member down, you have to take that out and you have to swap it out make sure it's not uh, stripped. But there's also a gear that goes on the shaft right here. And if that has moved, then the whole tail shaft that comes out and it can be a really big problem. I know Norris is going to uh, be putting a different transmission in here, so we'll see if it's worth uh, his money for me to fix it. With the drill turning counterclockwise, you spin it slowly and you can watch what happens. I know that shot was dark, but uh, it shows that the speedometer does work with the drill. So the problem is inside the transmission. We'll see if he wants to take the time to fix that. So if you notice in the uh, last video segment, the horn button was rattling around and making this awful noise. And the reason for that are these plastic rivets right here. So this one it looks like it's kind of given up the ghost and it makes it so this doesn't stay tight. And because of that, the horn button will rattle around. Luckily, I have a few extra rivets I can throw in um, and fix that problem. I mean, it might be something as simple as the horn button rattling, but it's so loud and so annoying that we got to get it done. Well, it turns out the uh, rivets weren't really broken at all. So what had happened was, you see how the, the center is just pushed a little bit above uh, the parts that come through? They had just kind of worked themselves loose. I think this is a reproduction uh, piece. And so what I did is I took them out and then all inserted them back in, pushing the centers below the tops right here. And what that has done is it has firmed everything up. And so now it doesn't jiggle around and wiggle like it used to do. So hopefully that will fix it enough for now. And if it ever happens again, Norris will know what the fix is going to be either get another one of these or mess around with these rivets again. But they're not broken, so I didn't feel like there was a need to uh, to mess around with that any further. With the rivets finished, it's actually a lot less wobbly than it was. Uh, this still moves a little bit because it's supposed to, but it doesn't. it's not going to make that, that rattle sound like it did. Next time we drive it, we'll make sure of that, but pretty sure we're good to go.